I will call this meeting of the Santa Cruz Metropolitan Transit District Board of Directors to order on May 20th, 2022. And can we have a roll call, please? Uh, Director Brown. Uh, present. Director Downey. Present. Director Dutra. Here. Uh, Director Calhoun Johnson is absent. Director Comed is absent. Director Lynn. Here. Director McPherson. Not seeing him. Okay. Director Bonner is absent. Director Pagebert. Here. Director Parker. Here. Director Rockin. And Mike. Uh, Director uh, or ex officio Director Henderson. Here. And ex officio Director Northcap. Okay. And we do have quorum. Okay. Well, thank you. Maybe we'll see people come on as time progresses. Yeah. Any announcements? Uh, just today's meeting is being broadcast by Community TV. Thank you, Donna. <laughs> uh, all right. Any comments from our board of directors? I have one. Please go ahead, Rebecca. Thank you. Uh, if you'll recall earlier uh, this year, we received a letter and petition from the La Selva Beach community asking for the return of both Paracruz and Route 55 to their neighborhood, uh, which was cut off, I believe, in 2016. Because this neighborhood is a bit too far from the closest fixed route in Seascape, it does not currently qualify for Paracruz service. Uh, Supervisor Friend hosted a La Selva Beach community Zoom meeting last month with John Ergo to review the situation and the possibility of returning Metro service to the neighborhood. John described the challenges Metro currently faces with the shortage of operators, and he explained that once staffing levels improved, it may be possible to extend Paracruz uh, service back to La Selva Beach. And the return of the fixed route uh, service would also require bus operator staffing levels to increase, and there was discussion about the possibility of adjusting Route 55 to return service there in the future. Both Supervisor Friend and the meeting attendees were grateful for John's time and his clear uh, communication of the intricacies involved in service design, design and implementation. Because we're in a new normal of an extremely short staff of operators and will be for the foreseeable future, I think there should be thresholds, if not already established, for the return of services for our communities that have had theirs removed. La Selva is a small community, but it has been completely isolated from transit for several years. And while we will always need more operators, there should be a point when service is restored and the system established to do so. Supervisor Friend requested our board consider this and direct staff to look into establishing threshold criteria for returning services to La Selva and other communities. Um, I'm new to Metro, so if a system of restoration of services already exists, let's use it to help neighborhoods get their Metro back. Um, this relates to an article published yesterday in The Economist where travel now is described less like an asterisk or in our county, like an hourglass and more like a spider web because people are choosing to work more often from home and take fewer often shorter trips along routes moving to the side as well as in and out of metropolitan areas. And while we will always need reliable service in and between Santa Cruz and Watsonville, planning for coverage in the San Lorenzo Valley, Capitola, Aptos and beyond must also be included in our transit web, especially once the bus on shoulder lanes are established. Finally, I wanted to thank Michael for your presentation yesterday in the Zoom room. Uh, your descriptions of your previous work showed some ideas we can certainly implement here. And I look forward to live music on the bus one day. Thank you. Thank you, Director Downing. Uh, any other comments or? Mr. Chair, do you see me or hear me now? I yes. do, I okay. do see you. 
And I see that Director Rotkin has joined us as well. All and right. also Alta is here as well. Oh yes, thank you. I see her now. All right, uh, oral and written communications to the board. I know that we've had three items in the packet. Donna just sent an additional message that uh, by email we received, I think this morning. Yes, and also uh, last night. Very good. And I'm looking to uh, the public. I see some attendees, but I don't see any hands up. If we have any other communications from the public. Uh, there is a hand up in the public. And uh, there we go. Um, I will call on Tate Baugh. Tate, can you hear us? I, can you hear me now? Yes. yes, there you go. Hi, um, I'm really new at this meeting. Um, so just want to let you know that um, I, I, I sent an email at the last minute, so I apologize for that. Um, but I just want to say that um, I want to congratulate you for letting uh, one of the bus routes, Route 17, operate every day, including holidays, the one that provides service from Santa Cruz to San Jose. Um, I am. I also want to let you know that I'm a little concerned about a couple of things. One, um, the, the delay going on on the freeway sometimes, which I hope there could be improvement, like, I don't know, maybe a bus only lane or something that would prevent any further delays. And two, I've noticed a lot of bus trips have been getting canceled due to shortage amount of bus drivers. So what I'm just trying to say is I'm hoping there could be a way like whenever the hiring starts, I hope there could be a way to give people more time to like look for people who could apply for jobs as bus drivers because I'm doing everything I can to spread the word out to other people to get jobs as bus drivers so that this cancellation can possibly stop for good. And I know it's been going on since the pandemic of coronavirus. So I just want to let you know that that's all. So that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Tate. Thank you for your comments. We appreciate that. Um, I think we go on to the next item. I uh, don't see any other hands. And so we're on to labor organization communications. Do we have our labor folks here today and anything they care to say? I see Brandon. Brandon Freeman, would you like? take the hand down as well, probably. Try now, Brandon. Okay, there we go. There we are. Good morning, Brandon Freeman, Senior Vice Chair for Smart UTU 23. Um, as you know, I usually refrain from speaking too much publicly. Uh, unfortunately, when I do, it seems as though it's under some kind of controversy. However, today, I'm pleased to say that most of what I have to say is going to be positive. Um, I don't know if you're aware or not, but for the last week or two, James has been enjoying a much needed vacation and recharge. And I've had the honor of acting as the chair for our union on a day-to-day -day basis while our new CEO, Michael Tree, has been getting adjusted to his new role here at Metro. I've had the absolute pleasure of spending more time with him these last couple of weeks than I was ever allowed by his predecessor. My first impression of Michael was simply, wow, he's human. There was no ego or chest puffing when he was at our operations building on him before he had even officially started meeting operators and introducing himself. My impression of Michael is that he's a genuine guy who tells you like it is, but it comes off more like a caring uncle or a family member than any kind of authoritarian figure. In just the last couple of weeks, Michael has found time to answer any and all questions that I have and has visited operations and met with several of our drivers. He's shown me that he's focused on recruitment and retention to a degree that far surpasses the lip service that I'm used to from that office. From scheduling to uh, adjusting pay scales for new hires, everything in between, it's clear to me that Michael has a firm understanding of what daily life is like for us under operators, especially under the current shortage, and has a genuine interest in improving our daily work lives from commodities at the operations building to our schedules, and taking in consideration the fact that the majority of us commute from South County or beyond daily. Just the buzz that Michael has generated with these actions and these conversations has already begun improving operator morale. For the first time in many years, we're finally seeing a positive morale trend. Many people have cautioned me that, hey, take your time. This could just be a honeymoon period and it'll wear off. But I honestly don't believe that that's the case. 
Michael strikes me as someone who's true to who he is. And I don't imagine that his attitude or willingness to work with us will change. So I wanted to thank everyone involved in the recruitment and hiring process for picking us pretty much exactly what we were asking for from you guys. Uh, we definitely appreciate that you listened to our concerns as a union and as operators and really brought us someone who has new, fresh ideas and a great willingness to work with all of us. Changing up gear slightly, I do want to publicly acknowledge and thank Don Cremay for the work that she has done and all the meetings that we have had to make all of the details of some of these changes come to life. Um, I'm sure you guys are, know about or are going to hear about today the starting wage adjustment to try to get that uh, bottom pay raised a little bit to attract new operators as well as in talking with me and including me on some of the new uh, promotional materials that we'll be putting out to help with that recruitment process. So I wanted to give a big shout out to Don there for working with me on that, even though on one of the days she had to come in and meet with me was actually her birthday. So definitely want to give her props for that. Mm -hmm. The last thing that I wanted to talk about is uh, not quite as sunshine and roses as the first couple of things, um, the Proterra buses. So I know there's a big conversation that's revolving around hydrogen versus battery electric, and we have a mandate approaching. We need to go to an electric fleet. Um, however, the experience that we have had as operators with the Proterra buses really kind of boils down to, well, they have the range that we want and they're fairly quick, but there is no other area that you can check a positive box on these buses. They are, for whatever reason, most likely weight reduction reasons, they're very, very rattly. They're very rickety. Um, and it is not uncommon to have hand stanchions, to have visors, to have screws falling off these buses under normal operation. I know that our shop and our maintenance division has done everything that they can when these issues come up as far as securing the screws, changing the screws, making sure that they're the right ones, but the problems persist. Um, it is not uncommon for us to go out into the yard to check these buses out and have them just be completely unresponsive and not even be able to open the doors to get into them to check them out. I'm hoping that while we are under pressure to move to electric, we are also paying a very large sum of money per bus. And I don't think that we are getting necessarily the quality that we deserve for the price that we are paying with Proterra. Uh, we have buses that are 24 years old that were made in 1998 by New Flyer, and they feel and drive more premium than our brand new electric buses. So I'm hoping that the range discussion does not eclipse and make us forget about the fact that the comfort of both our operators and our passengers, as well as the reliability of these buses, are just as important as moving to a new propulsion system. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your comments, Brandon. I see a hand from Jordan Vascon, Vascons. Jordan, would you like to speak? There you are. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, I just want to echo what Brandon uh, was saying. Working with Michael so far has been an absolute great time and um, his attitude is so positive and his willingness to kind of meet everybody and, you know, make the necessary changes to kind of improve morale and whatnot. It's, it's been just absolutely great. Um, I just want to give a lot of uh, credit and respect to Michael and for all the board members that um, appointed him. So thank you very much. Thank you, Jordan. Um, I see no other hands from the public. And so with that, I think I'll move on to the Metro Advisory Committee written communications. Donna, do we have anything other than the minutes? I think not. Sorry, there are none. Okay, thank you. And I believe there are, are no additional documentation uh, being distributed to the board. That's correct, there are none. Very good. All right, so with that, we reached the consent agenda. And uh, I'd ask if there are any items in the consent agenda that a director would like pulled for discussion or a motion to approve. We ask the public and then I'll be happy to make the motion. Thank you, Mike. Uh, any comment from the public on items from the consent agenda? 
I will then move the, I will move the approval of the consent agenda. A second. We have a motion from Rockin. The second was Donna Lind. Thank you. Let's uh, have a roll call vote on that item. Uh, Director Brown. Aye. Director Downey. Aye. Director Dutra. Aye. Director Lind. Aye. Director McPherson. Aye. Director Pegler. Aye. Director Parker. Not here. All right. Um, no, I'm here. She's here. Oh, I saw her. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. All right. And then Director Rockton. Aye. And the motion passes. Thank you. All right. Then with that, we'll move into the regular agenda. And the first item is a presentation of an employee 10 year longevity award to Delee Brubeck. And uh, I have a nice lengthy piece to read about Delee. Um, she is a human resource technician and administrative assistant in operations. This May will mark 10 years that Delia has been working for Santa Cruz Metro. Delia worked as, uh, in human resources until a few months ago when she decided to start a fresh chapter at Metro by moving to operations to serve as the administrative assistant. She has brought a great sense of liveliness, attention to detail, and vision for the future to the work here involving our bus operators and transit supervisors. Most recently, she assisted with the annual Transit Worker Appreciation Day here at Metro, planning and arranging all the events, food and catering equipment. One of Delee's talents we most love is how she really knows and appreciates the people with whom she works. She began her career at Metro working in human resources as a human resource technician and spent the last 10 years in that field Many of Metro's employees have Delee to thank for finding them their jobs here. She was prepared for this work by her previous employment working for Volt Services. And before that, she lived in the Los Angeles area and worked as a casting agent for Universal Studios Television Department. So when Delee says you have star quality, you better believe it. Delee grew up with her brother and sister here in Santa Cruz and they all live nearby with their families with whom she is very close. She also has standing Tuesday taco nights with her daughter, Kira, and her partner, Callie. She enjoys her family get-togethers, her kitten Harlem, baking, and all that Santa Cruz has to offer. And we all enjoy the lead. So, appreciations. Thank you for your efforts. 10 years of service. Let's get another 10 at least. And with that, we'll go to... Item 11, approval of formal ratification of a labor agreement extension between Smart Union Local 23 fixed route for the period of July 1st through June 30th, 2023. Good morning, everyone. Dawn from HR Director. Um, if, if it's okay with you, I'd like to go through 11, 12, and 13. Um, That's perfect. <laughs> okay, perfect. Um, so as you know, uh, we were due to um, negotiate this um, this coming end of the contract, which was June. So we were due to start negotiating here pretty shortly. Um, as you know, with COVID and everything else contentious over the last couple of years, um, it, it just didn't feel right to sit down and, and go through negotiations. And, you know, especially when we have a new CEO coming on board, we wanted to, um, kind of start fresh and, and everybody kind of engage and, and um, start fresh. So um, we decided to work with the unions and negotiate a uh, percentage to roll over the contract for one year. Um, the unions both agreed to that. So uh, we are proposing that we increase wages by three and a half percent and do a one-time payout of $1,500 um, for, for each, all three unions. Um, and so we are asking for you to approve that today. Very good. Questions from the board? Any comments from the public? Do I see a motion from the board? I will move approval of these three contracts. Okay. I see a motion from Brockton, second from McPherson. And we're voting on all three. Yep, that's, that's the, the motion. Very good. 
<clears throat> Donna, when you're ready for a roll call. Unmute. I'm so sorry. There Director you go. Brown. Hi. Director Downey. Hi. Director Dutra. Hi. Director Lynn. Hi. Director McPherson. Hi. Director Pegler. Hi. Director Parker. Hi. And Director Rockin. Hi. And the motion passes. Very good. Thank you to everyone for your hard work on moving this through. I'm happy that we've crossed this threshold. Item 14, um, district ballot for Pajaro Regional Flood Management Agency. I think Chuck is gonna present on this item. Yeah, I'll, I'm gonna go over this. So I'm gonna give you a little brief background and then gonna go through it. I actually have Kim and Mark on here in case any really detailed questions come up. But let me tell you what this is. So uh, down in Watsonville, we got this, you know, Pajaro River, and they've secured enough funding to, I'll just say, fix the and and enhance the uh, levee that keeps the town from flooding or majority of the town from flooding it in a like say a hundred year flood. As part of that, um, there's an ongoing maintenance that we need to do every single year to maintain this levee in place. So as part of that, they are asking that we vote on whether we are going to do and have those people that are in floodplains uh, pay an assessment, annual assessment, or do we say no and effectively they don't end up going down this path of fixing the levy and then of course there's issues there. So a little bit of a background here. Um, our, we own two properties in Watsonville. We own the transit center, but we also own the property next to it. And in the property next to the transit center it is actually leased to the city of Watsonville on a 99 year lease at a dollar per year. And what they did was they, Watsonville then subleased that to um, a housing corporation, uh, Mid Peninsula Housing Coalition to develop 46 low-income units, as well as um, a child care center. And it was built back in 2000, and I think five or six is when it was actually completed. Six. And as part of that process, you know, we've kind of kept a hands off, uh, hands off on that property. However, with the levy, the levy, we have to vote on either yes, we go ahead with the maintenance or no, because we own the land still. So effectively, we are the voters on behalf of the city of Watsonville, as well as this Via Del Mar is really the development that sits on our land. Um, to give you an idea of the assessment, the assessment is based off of the square footage of the property that could flood. Our transit center, being kind of smaller, is only $571 a year. However, the assessment on the um, Via Del Mar is $2,271 a year. And this is low income and the bill would be paid by the city of Watsonville and how they handle it. I'm not sure exactly, but it is our recommendation that uh, the board uh, gives the approval to our GM CEO, Michael Tree to vote affirmative or yes, to uh, move forward with this assessment so that we continue this, uh, keep that levy in great shape. And then if we experience a flood, it stays you know, it doesn't come over our levy and flood most of Watsonville as well as our transit center and via Del Mar. Hopefully I did that. If you have more detailed questions, I think Kim and Mark can help out a little bit better than I can. Thank you, Chuck. Comments, Thanks. questions from the board? Uh, well, I was going to let um, <clears throat> Jimmy or Ari say something, but I know that uh, Zach Friend and Greg Cap have worked diligently on this uh, Pyro levy thing. This has been 50 years in the making. It's gonna be moving forward for a vote um, and hopefully it'll be passed by the voters, but uh, it's a much needed improvement that needs to be done on the levy. Uh, it's hard to believe we're gonna have another rainstorm that will cause a flood these days, but uh, it's out there. And so I, I, I strongly urge that we support this recommendation. Thank you, Bruce. Uh, Director Parker. Thank you. Yes, I agree 100% uh, with uh, Supervisor McPherson. Um, 
uh, we're, we have been working for 50 plus years, uh, almost my entire lifetime. Uh, my family's been through many floods here and it's not only to protect um, the city of Watsonville, but the township of Paro and all the agricultural land that we have uh, uh, surrounding the Paro floodplain. Uh, so yes, <coughs> I'm glad the city of, excuse my, my voice, I took my students to international games yesterday and I was one of their you know, greatest cheer honors, but I've lost a lot of it. But um, so I, I have to say that this is, um, this is something we'll never be able to get funding for in this way again. Uh, the state of California, the federal government, through our representatives have brought us um, monies to uh, finish this project uh, in a way that we never dreamed possible. And now that it's here, all we have to do is, um, is maintain it. And so that's the last step. And once that last step happens, then Army Corps of Engineers and everything keeps moving forward. So yes, um, this is uh, very important to South County and to especially to Pajaro um, and uh, uh, Watsonville. Thank you. Thank you, Director Parker. Director Dutra. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, I, I just want to say also, you know, thank you to Congressman Panetta, who has worked um, really hard on this project. We are really sad we're, we're going to be losing him as our congressman, um, and we're going to be sad we're going to be cut out of the rest of the county. But um, he's worked hard for our community, and this is just one of the projects that he, um, you know, really helped change once, once he got elected. I know we've been working on this for, what, 50 years, way, you know, well before I was even born. So, um, the fact the fact that it's actually come to fruition is um, really exciting for our community. I, you know, it the the levee is along one of the most you know vulnerable parts of our community, which is our adult villages and and um, also into places where people live on a limited income. So um, it's important that we make sure that we protect them. And and as you heard earlier, this building that we have um, is for low income um, families and people. So. Um, we need to make sure that they feel safe um, in their in their um, building. This is something that um, I, I definitely support. I'm excited that it's happening um, in my lifetime. I always say there's things I probably won't ever see in my lifetime, but this one I get to see. So um, this is great for our community, and um, I look forward to it moving forward. And I'm really, really hopeful that the rest of the voters who are voting on it now um, will uh, support, support their part in it as well. Thank you. Thank you, Director Dutra. Any other comment? Do I see a motion? I'll move I'll that we approve. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll defer to someone else if they'd rather do it. I'll move, I'll move the motion. Thank you. I'll second the motion. Jimmy just made. All right. We have a motion from Director Dutra, second from Rotkin. Can uh, I also that's, that's too bad. I'd really love to second it. Mike. I'll, I'll, re I'll remove my second. Thank you very much. I'd like to second There we that. go. And let me add. Could I add to the uh, ask as a friendly amendment that we uh, publicize our uh, approval of this, uh, perhaps the issue a press release that we've uh, voted to, if our vote goes away, I think it will, that, that we have voted to approve this. That might help get some of the other voters in Watsonville to join as well. Uh, I'd agree with that. I, I, that's a great idea, actually, too, because yeah. not only are we playing our part, but farmers are also going to be paying their part and, and um, homeowners. So um, I think good publicity would actually maybe encourage people to do it. All right, do you know when the last day to vote is? Uh, no, I don't have that down. Yeah. But, uh, they're voting now, I think. They're voting now. We've had the ballots for a few weeks. Yeah. Through, through the chair, I can I can provide an answer thank for you, that. Thank you, Mark. Um, sure, yeah, please do, Mark. Yeah, thank you. Um, the last day to vote is June 8th, so we will be holding a public hearing as required by Prop 218 on the evening of June 8th in the city council chambers in Watsonville. And voters can either mail in their ballots, they can either deliver them to the Paha Regional Flood Management Agency office at 701 Ocean Street, or they can hand deliver them to that uh, meeting up to the close of that public meeting. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. All right. We have can a I motion. Ask, can second. I ask a, Yes. I just want to ask you a quick question. Is, um, our, is the Pajaro community also voting in Monterey County? Uh, well, Mark yes. can tell you more specific. Everybody who is in 
uh, the assessment district, which is not the whole okay. city of Watsonville. It's limited to those people that um, would have uh, damages from flooding directly. Is that correct, Mark? Yeah, th through the chair, yes. So what we've done is we've modeled where floodwaters would go if we were not able to properly maintain the levee system. And that includes much of the city of Watsonville, although not entirely all of Watsonville. It also includes the town of Pajaro. So it's both sides of the river. It's the entire floodplain of the Pajaro River and uh, Salsa Poitas and Corleos Creek um, up to approximately the Green Valley Road area. And that's Very why good. there's a JPA that has been created and they're the ones sending out the assessment votes and they're in charge okay. of that. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for the clarification. But let me, let me direct you Can I also, while we have a moment here, I, I do ocean kayaking and river kayaking, and I, I'm amazed that the, the Pajaro River is a beautiful place to kayak, and you can enter it through the, uh, a public park in Watsonville next to the treat, treatment plant there and on uh, Beach Street or wherever Beach Street becomes when it gets towards town. And I'm amazed that there's no, I never see anybody else out there. I mean, it's, it's an amazing recreational resource. And so uh, I'm just surprised that people haven't taken advantage of it because it's just beautiful and uh, a wonderful place to go paddling. And uh, I've done it six or seven times now. And I've literally never seen, I, I, one day I saw a person on a, a paddleboard, but one time and all those times I've been out there. So that that's a beautiful river and people should take advantage of the fact that it's right there in the middle of the community. I just wanted to make that a public statement about it. <laughs> Very good, Mike. All right, may we, uh, are we ready to vote? Donna? Director Brown? Aye. Director Downing? Aye. Director Dutra? Aye. Director Lynn? Aye. <clears throat> Director McPherson? Aye. Director Pegler? Aye. Uh, and Director Parker? Uh, yes. <laughs> and Director Rockin? Aye. And we, the motion passes. Very good. Thank you for that. And thank you, Mark, for your uh, additional information. All right. We are on to item 15. Um, this is the operating budgets for fiscal year 23 and 24. And I believe that's another item from chuck hi all right so i first i want to just say that right now metro is opening up uh the comment period for the approval of fy 23 santa cruz metro budget uh, a public hearing will take place on june 24th that's our board meeting um for the final adoption of the fy 23 operating capital budget for metro so uh, I, mean, I want to make that official. Now I'm going to kind of go through if we want to pull up the slides. Melissa, are you able to pull those up? Here we go. We see it. All right. All right. All right. So why don't we move? Go ahead and flip to the next page. So just high level summary i'm just going to quickly rock you through the fy 23 operated draft operating budget um we're calling a draft because it's not a finally it's not the official budget until we vote in uh the end of june uh, i'm going to run through the fy 23 24 operating budget because it's the two-year piece of it um talk about a few little risks a little bit of the capital and then some additional information and then of course on june 24th we're going to vote to approve this as is. So if we want to uh, skip two pages, the one more. So the way the, uh, but oh, right there you go. So right now I'm comparing FY22 budget versus FY23 budget. We've almost certainly balanced the FY23 budget. We're at $329,000, a slightly over, which is actually really good news. Um, we're primarily flat on our operating revenues. And then of course our costs are up but we have some offsets down in our non-operating revenues. And I'll explain this on the, next, on the next few slides. So if we move to the next slide. So what we're assuming on our, op on our operating revenue side is that our passengers, passenger fares are about 5% budget versus budget. 
Um, the big increase is our fixed route of 186 and our paratransit, which is almost at pre-COVID levels, which is actually really good news. Where we are at kind of a miss is the fact that our Highway 17 remains kind of our F below our FY22 budget. And to be clear, the budget that we have in here, we assumed we were back to fully operating. Um, so, you know, that didn't happen because COVID just continued and continued and continued. But uh, so everything I'm talking about for the budget, assume that we're already back at pre-COVID levels. Um, so, and FY17 still remains low. And like I said, you know, as companies start to kind of come back into service, hopefully people will start moving or back to in-person um, business. Hopefully people will start taking the buses. But like I said, we see that as a lot more of a long-term impact and that's why it's much lower. Our special transit fares are driven pretty much by our contracts. So uh, between 22 to 23, we're about $72,000 lower. And that's because we actually have reduced service, which is in the contract for Cabrillo College, which is about 165K below. If we move to the next slide. So visually, our operating expenses, as you can see from 22 to 23, is primarily driven by the first three green bars. It's labor, overtime, and fringe. Overtime is relatively flat, but our labor and fringe is up. And that's really driven by our, not necessarily the number of people that we've added to the service, it's roughly the same, it's three more but it, it really has to do with um, uh, our wage increases that we're putting in, which is the three and a half. It also includes the uh, step and longevity increases too as well. Can I ask so Chuck what, about that? On, on the labor, are, we're assuming that we have all our driver's positions filled in this, bud, in this budget, even though we're way down. And in fact, so if we're successful in getting a lot more drivers back, this would be accurate, but if we don't, then in fact, these numbers will, will be, we won't be spending as much as we otherwise had anticipated here. We'll probably have more overtime. That, that's exactly, it. you're right. That's exactly it. Our labor and fringe will go down, but our overtime will go dramatically up if we end up um, going the opposite way or we don't have enough drivers. Let's hope that doesn't happen, but there we are. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. And then the rest is non-personnel. So overall, it's, all, it's about a $4.3 million increase. So if you go to the next slide, just to kind of, there we go. So on the personnel side is about 2.5 million, that 4.3. Uh, labor is about 1.4. That includes the $3.5 million increase that we expect, as well as the $1,500 one-time payout. And then contractual step and longevity increase. That's what I mentioned before. We do have six incremental positions, uh, three bus drivers, one paratransit, an accountant and a, and a provisional two-year IT project coordinator. The fixed route bus drivers and paratrans are all gonna be covered by Measure D. Um, we do expect kind of like an overtime increase and then of course medical expenses because CPI is up about 5.6 and that may even go up depending on how uh, healthcare companies view COVID and all the claims that are coming in over the last couple of years. We won't know that until probably January, of, January, February of next year. On the non-personnel side, which is the remaining 1.8 million, uh, that's primarily, we have $1 million for our South County planning. So this is to study all our South County, which is actually good news. And the remaining piece of about the 800,000 is really driven by all the inflation associated around the fuel on the vehicles, as well as utilities um, associated with um, electricity. And um, that's really driving the remaining portion of our non-personnel cost increase. So if we move to the next slide, on our non-operating expense, so this is, I'll just say, um, this is really our revenue and expenses that are not really necessarily associated with bus driving. So this is, um, from our budget of 40.7, we're actually going up to 55.8 million, which is actually good news. That's more you know, money in our pocket. Um, 4.5 million of it is driven by our sales tax and measure D, and then our federal and state grants are actually up by $6.2 million, um, which is actually another good news story. We are going to take our FTA 5307 and stick, which we usually use on operating. And here's the reason why we're going to move that to capital. And we need that because we are going to be buying a lot of buses and we need matching funds and we need that funding in our pocket. 
in return, this year, we're gonna finally do it so we don't have to talk about this all year long. We are actually gonna budget for what we expect to get in our era, our era, our, our um, COVID, release, COVID relief grants. Right now it's 15.9. If we don't get the bus drivers and we don't have the fringe, that number will come down. So what savings you may see on the labor and fringe, you'll also see the offset sitting here in the sense we won't get the COVID. It doesn't mean the money goes away, it just gets pushed to the next year. Um, and like I said, that's ARPA money. So um, right now we have a budget at 15.9 and then everything else is flat. So if you move, move to the next slide, this will give you a little bit more uh, perspective. So our sales tax right now for Measure D is up um, um, about $4.5 million. And like I said, it's 17% over the budget. We know that we've talked about it all, all year long that our sales tax has really been kind of blowing out our budget, but we're also looking at, you know, this dark hole of where is all this inflation going and it's going to create a recession or, or exactly what's what. So we're somewhat conservative on the 17%, but we feel confident that's actually a pretty good number. On the COVID relief grants, um, like I said, we've moved the $15.8 million of the uh, ARPA funding into the budget. On the offset, we're taking 11.2 million of our 5307 grants out. Um, that's 11.2 million, and we're moving that to capital. So our total and state federal grants actually increase, actually um, decreased by 5 million or 25.5%. And that's just because of the way we're doing the math here. On our non operating expense, um, our UAL and sales tax bond is basically only about a 7K decrease budget to budget. But had we not done the bond itself, um, our pension UAL would have been 6.3, but it's really going to be 4.5 now because we did the actual financing. So we're going to save 1.8 million just by doing the bond. Uh, repayment or the bond, the bond for the uh, pension. So that's actually good news, even though year over year it looks like it's flat. So if we move to the next slide, and then we have some transfers. So this is money that we moved from the bottom line after the fact that we moved. So uh, one thing we moved money into our capital and bus replacement fund. This is the three million dollars. There's already money put in there, and here's the residual amount. It's $3 million or a little bit more, but this is our bus replacement. Um, we were holding back um, $2 million for UAL and OPEP because we still haven't touched the OPEP piece of it. So we still have the $2 million in there. Uh, we're looking at the ERP system of about $2 million and then additional money because we're going to be aggressive. We have a lot of capital coming up uh, for grant matching of about, of about $2.5 could you explain briefly to the public what the ERP system is that we're getting for two mil? Sure. So the so the ERP system is um, a replacement of our accounting system, our finance system, our procurement system, our HR system, and our payroll system. So all of these systems don't talk, and they are very antiquated. We're talking about early two thousands. So we're even having problems doing. Uh, we can't do wire transfers and ACH transfers. Um, so we need a, a system that will talk among each of the different pieces um, so that when something changes in one place, it changes correctly in another place and we don't have this non interrelated related uh, information. I know it's back office. People don't like to spend money on it, but I think after two decades, I think it's probably a good thing that we kind of at least upgrade now. So we're back up into the 21st century. And then we could talk about it in 10 years again, if we need to vis revisit this, this, this solution. Thank you. And <laughs> if I may add, um, uh, it will also give us much more robust reporting uh, capabilities. That's one of the deficiencies that we're faced with right now. Um, so that's, that's a really big plus for this system. Okay. Move on to the next slide. And these are the changes I just talked about. What we're looking to do is the fund the mobility training coordinator and defund the accessibility coordinator. Um, we're looking to fund a marketing assistant and defund a customer service coordinator. So that's kind of a 
one for one. We're adding accounting, uh, uh, an accountant three, and then a two-year provisional IT project coordinator. So this person is going to work on the ERP. They're going to coordinate this across all the groups, across all of uh, back office support here, as well as some operational folks too, as well. And then uh, three bus drivers and one pair cruise van driver. We've added that in. And like I said, that's going to be covered by Measure D. I'm going to move to the next slide. All right, so 23-24 operating budget. I'm going to go fairly quick. This is, um, I'm going to move to the next slide. So I'm just going to uh, speak on this slide right now. Uh, we are uh, talking about our operating revenues are going to slightly go up. There's not a whole lot of change here. We're not going to expect to get our passenger fares back up to 100% year over year. Um, like I said, we're gradually coming out of COVID. It's going to take a little bit of time to kind of get there. Um, our special transit fares are based on contractual amounts. So that's fairly fixed. And that's the reason why we have the 2% increase. On our operating expense, this only includes longevity and steps. This does not include any type of pay raises or so forth. So it's uh, only a 1.9% overall increase, but that's partly because we haven't put those in. And like I said, we, well, when we get into contracting, you know, later in 20, 2023 um, and sit down with the unions, that may change. But right now, that's why it's kind of relatively flat. On the non-operating expense, and I want to point this out, um, on the third line down, it says COVID relief grants, $15.8 million, and then it says 2.7. That would be an FY24 if we spend the whole 15, if we draw down the whole $15.9 million in ARPA, as the budget indicated in 23, the remaining portion of ARPA, this is all the remaining COVID relief grant funding, will be pulled down in 24, and that's about $2.8 million and then it goes away. There's no more. We live on we live on uh, sales tax, Measure D, federal grants, and anything else that we may get, but there's no more of this COVID relief funding out there. And then at the bottom line, even with the things I just talked about and all the different changes, of, and I'm sorry, by the way, in 24, we are not moving over, at least in this view, any of the 5307 or stick money to capital. That only comes in 23, not in 24. And right now, the bottom line is, is slightly positive with uh, 518,000 cash flow. If we want to move to the next slide, I'm not going to go through that because I just kind of mentioned each of the different pieces. So um, I'm just going to page through the next slide. Excuse me. And the next slide. Um, and then these are the risks. I'll just quickly kind of cover a couple of them. So we put in a lot of the risk that's associated with it. We're, a lot of it's around COVID-19. We don't know where our fares are going to go and what's going to happen in the future. You know, and, and, you know, it could go up, could go down based off ridership and based off the current, you know, status of COVID-19. Um, contracts could be adjusted at, at the different colleges. And then, of course, we always have our federal or state type of appropriations that could come in there and make changes too as well. Um, and then of course, economic <coughs> down, we don't know what the recession is going to bring. And then there's fires, floods, earthquakes that could have impacts on our service. We move to the next slide. And then on the expense right now, um, like I said, we, we use CNG, um, electric as well as diesel engines. Failures could be issues. Fuel costs. I mean, that's a wild card right now. We're not sure where that's going to go. Uh, medical insurance, we won't know in January to see what the price is. And if a lot of people are going to the hospital with COVID and insurance is covering a lot of that, I wouldn't be surprised 5.6 may even be too low that it comes up. Um, as we're doing renewals of contracts, prices of products, prices of services are all going up. So they may even be, be way beyond what we currently have right now. Our aging fleet maintenance costs, um, and so forth. And then, of course, overtime costs due to shortage of drivers. You know, we don't want to burn out our drivers. So um, go ahead. So um, in the past, we had a big crisis with workers' comp insurance, which we fixed, and we're doing really well for the last couple of years. I just wanted to ask if there's, how are we doing in terms of workers' comp, or are we staying, you know, doing a good job of controlling the things that lead to workers' compensation claims? 
And I'm going to let Curtis answer that question or Don. It's, it's sort of a financial issue about like how much we're paying out in workers' comp. I guess Don probably would say that. Um, so what I can say with our workers' comp that's, that has changed tremendously with Curtis coming aboard is what we're doing now is when we see repetitive injuries happening, um, like in the same department or same group of people or just doing the same repetitive job, we're getting Curtis involved um, in the beginning. And so what he'll do is he'll go over and do a complete assessment of the area to find out is it something in the way that the employee um, was actually doing it or do we need to change something in our process? Um, so we have been able to get control over um, a lot of, of the claims. You know, we, you know, we're pulling video, things like that. So we can see exactly how somebody fell or somebody twisted their back or, or whatever it is that their, that their injury is. Um, and then uh, Curtis will write up a report and I, I'll let him talk further on that. But um, my point is getting Curtis involved um, in the beginning has tremendously uh, uh, helped our claims go down. I mean, I just want to also kind of piggyback as well. Uh, the agency, we've also have had uh, professional contractors come out and do uh, ergonomics and as well as uh, other type of environmental uh, potential hazards to avoid uh, future claims for this transit agency. Thank you. Thanks to both of you. That's it for me. Okay. Let's move on to the next slide. All right, now we're going to do FY23 kid capital budget. Um, move on to the next slide. So right now we're proposing at this point in time, uh, our FY23 budget will be 15.8 million and the total portfolio 13.8. Of that 15.8, the, the big pieces here are um, our revenue vehicle replacements. So this is actually seven um, buses that are CNG and um, our vehicle electrification are uh, is four electric Proteras, which I know we had a discussion earlier about that. That's what's sitting in the budget right now for the 15.8. And in our FY24 plan, which I'll explain, our construction, re our construction related um, projects is the um, Pacific Station redevelopment. It's our portion of that project. Is primarily drives that that higher number because we have four million dollars set aside for that. Um, our revenue vehicle replacement again includes still some that starts to include. I'm sorry, that includes four uh, CNG Arctic buses that is in that value, and then um, and that's fourteen point one. And like I said, the whole pro the the whole remaining portfolio spend is thirteen point eight at this point in time. I'd like to call the public's attention to the, in, the, in our packet, the beginning, there's a letter or exchange between uh, Pauline Sales and myself about why we're still buying CNG buses, although we are committed to becoming a completely electric fleet. Um, and rather than talk about it here, I just would refer people to those, that exchange, which explains that uh, it, it has to do with financial capability and we just can't afford to replace all our buses instantly with electric, but we do have a plan to be uh, all electric ahead of the state uh, requirement that we do so. Yeah. Okay, we're gonna move on to the next slide. Just some of the capital breakdown here. Um, you know, how we're spending that 33.8 million for that whole portfolio. Approximately 44% of that is coming from federal grants from the FTA, where our operating capital reserve fund is funding about 23% of this. Our transfers from our operating budget, like Measure D, is about another 6.3. And then the remaining portion comes from various other little uh, grants and so forth and programs. So more than half is coming from, or 70% of it is coming from federal grants and our operating capital reserve, which is like our matching piece of a portion of that. Move on to the next slide, please. Keep going, one more. Um, I'm not going to go through all of these. They are here, uh, you know, just to save a little bit of time. But these are different support activities that we're listing. It doesn't mean we're limited to this. It doesn't mean that we can't expand upon this. But as of today, we're looking at different things to do, such as the Santa Cruz County Fair, Stuff the Bus, 
um, Earth Day events and so forth of that nature. And as we come out of COVID, this list may even get bigger because we can actually get out there in the field more so than we have in the past. Move to the next slide. And the next few slides are membership uh, things for each of the different areas. So this is already in the budget. This is just detailing out um, membership things for uh, the actual agency to become, uh, to keep the membership in, in APTA of about $40,000. And so for CTA and the different things you can look through. If you have any questions on this, you know, feel free to uh, reach out, but I'm not gonna go through all of these different items, but I wanna give you an idea of what's there. Move to the next slide. And then here's the next pieces for human resources, which is more labor related and then risk and then purchasing as well. And then the next slide after that are our totals. So fleet maintenance two, FY23 is about $101,000 and FY24 goes up slightly to $103,000 due to inflation. And those are memberships, move on to the next slide. And then these are, just estimated right now, that doesn't mean that this is, we're locked in, but possible board member travel, if, if it goes to that, you know, we have an annual conference for APTA up in Seattle in October, and then the legislative conference in March of next year in D Washington, DC. Possible CTA meetings too, one in November, which is still TBD, and then another one in May for legislative, and that's still TBD. But just to kind of, and it could change, it could grow, it could be a bit less, but at least kind of give you an idea. And we move to the next slide. And then this is our employee incentive awards. So as part of the budget, this is already in, this just breaks out the different pieces. So you can see um, employee picnic and holiday, district service award, transit private um, appreciation day, employee appreciation events. By the way, this has been really nothing here over the last year and a half because we've been in COVID lockdown. So by doing this, this is, you know, we're coming out of this COVID lockdown. If we can get people together like this, this is great news. So I can't really show you 22 to 23 because you'll see nothing going to something in 23, but it, we did this before COVID and now we're coming out of COVID and this is a good thing. And then of course, a lot of awards too, as well. We move to the next slide. And then lastly, the budget, we're gonna come in June. And if anybody has any comments, please, you know, you got 30 days plus to uh, come with those comments. And then hopefully at the end of June, we'll have this approved and move forward. And that's it. Very good. Thank you, Chuck. That was Thanks. very complete. Uh, questions, comments from the board? I had a quick question about the incentive uh, for employees. Does that also include uh, employee referral bonuses that uh, the program that um, is being developed right now for recruitment? This, that's, I'll say in, in that slide you saw does not include the incentive for employees for, for ref, you know, getting people here. Okay. This is only like normal stuff that, that, that they, takes place, but it doesn't mean we can't have it elsewhere in our budget. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Director Lynn. Well, I want to thank the uh, thank Chuck and, and your team because this has just been outstanding work and under difficult circumstances, and particularly the savings on the unfunded pension liability. I mean, almost two million. And that's you guys doing that research, acting quickly, because I've heard some agencies wishing they would have pursued, you know, the bonds, you know, wish they to take the action that you did in um, diversely investing and protecting us and saving us, like I said, almost 2 million. So, um, but if you didn't, if, if we hadn't moved when you did, that opportunity wouldn't be there, so. Um, really want to commend you for that work. Thanks. Thank you, Donna. Any other comments? Uh, Director McPherson. Yeah, I, I ditto what Donald said. Uh, how about our, the reserve account? We, 
I, I don't know, I was going trying to get through the numbers. Where are we or where can we be uh, realistically? You mean the, the, our reserve buckets and so forth? Right. So we're going to actually present that at the next um, uh, meeting. Okay. In right. June, we're working through it right now. Okay. Thank but we're, we're good for now. Just <laughs> Thank you. Very good. Any other questions, comments? Do we have a motion? We're gonna ask the public if they have any comments. Oh, thank you, Mike. Uh, I'm looking to the public and I don't see any hands yet. I'll give it just a couple moments. I'm seeing none. I'll move that we publish this uh, budget for uh, purpose of getting public input before our final budget decision in June. Second. Excuse me, just to clarify, you're, all you're being asked to do is to adopt the resolution to set the public hearing. Exactly. That's the motion. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. So motion Rotkin, second McPherson. Um, maybe have a roll call vote. Okay. Uh, Director Brown. Aye. Director Downing. Aye. Director Dutra. Aye. Director Lynn. Aye. Director McPherson? Aye. Director Pegler? Aye. Director Parker? Aye. And Director Rockin? Aye. And the motion passes. Very good. Thank you all. Item 16, consideration of approving authorization and funding for a capital planning and grants programs manager. I think this is Dawn's item. Yes, good morning again. Dawn Kermay, HR Director. Um, I would like to talk to the board and ask you to approve the um, funding of the capital planning and grants program manager. Um, this would be a reclassification from our current grant analyst position. Um, we currently do have an employee in our grants analyst position. His name is Wanda Moo Mangasu. Sorry, please forgive my voice. He has been employed uh, by Metro since October 2018 and during his employment with Metro, He's received special training in capital planning and grants program management, grant writing, budget and revenue pro uh, projects, federal and state and local laws and regulations affecting Metro capital planning and compliance with grants programs and legislative and policy analysis techniques related to advocating for Metro's priority policy positions. Um, he's also received training in specialized software applications, platforms and systems such as grants.gov, transit award management system, National Transit Database, HealthSmart, and BlackTap. So during the last two years, um, Mr. Mingsu has taken on tremendous um, responsibilities that have, have increased his position. Um, so we sat down with um, the director of planning and we worked with an outside vendor, um, Coffin Associates, to, um, to rewrite the job description and uh, get it to where it, it, it truly, um, truly listed his his current um, duties and not what, what his old position had said. So um, during that, a reclassification study was done. Um, a new job description, description was written um, that better fit his duties. Um, we did meet with the unions and the union, uh, the union is in agreement with our, our new job description. We met with um, Wanda Moon, he's in agreement with it. So um, today we're asking for you to allow us to proceed with the reclassification into this position. Um, we would not, what we would do is move the funding from the current grants analyst position into this program manager position. Um, so there would be a difference in that, but it is not a, um, it's, it's not an addition. It's just, we're moving it over and reclassifying it. Very good. Questions, comments from the board? I'll just say that I think Wandam has done a wonderful job for us in terms of the grant program that we have at the district. And uh, definitely um, not only is the job change, but as someone who's doing the job well and actually getting us the money, which is where the bottom line for us, I, I think that, that this is definitely a wise move on our part and everything we can do to keep him doing the work he does for us is important. So pending comments from the public, I'm happy to move this. All right, and looking to the public, any comments? from the public. We have a small public today, only mm -hmm. eight folks, but I see no hands. So move, let's bring move, it back to the board. I'll move approval um, uh, of the recommendation of staff. Second. 
to motion rock and second was director lynn mm -hmm. i'm sorry i didn't yes okay thank you all right roll call vote please hey director brown aye director downey aye director dutra aye director lynn you're muted donna aye Thank you. Director McPherson. Aye. Director Pegler. Aye. Director Parker. Aye. And Director Rockin. Aye. And the motion passes. Very good. Thank you. And thank you, Wanda Moo, for all your work. All right. Item 17, oral report from our CEO. All right. Good Michael morning, Tree. everyone. It's, uh, it's great to be here. Uh, great to be on board. Uh, I started on April 25th and uh, then immediately had to take a few days off for my wife's 50th birthday. We kind of had some prearranged uh, plans, but uh, went to uh, see an Eagles concert. So, um, but I uh, was quickly back in the saddle and, uh, you know, it's been a great couple of weeks. I, you know, my overall impression, I'll just say right off the bat, I'm really excited to be here, uh, excited because you have great employees. Uh, you have great service. I mean, my my initial impressions are just really positive. Um, I, I did want to just make mention of some of the visits that I have, uh, uh, you know, had a chance to to do. Um, met with several board members and uh, looking forward to meeting with the rest of you. Uh, those have been really great one on ones, and just uh, you know, it's fun to see your excitement uh, for all the things that you are working on and and uh, things that you think are important moving forward. Um, had a chance to sit down with Senator Laird in Sacramento and spend uh, about 45 minutes with him. Uh, a fantastic uh, man. And I, I just really view him as being pivotal in working with the agency moving forward, especially with uh, some of the massive amounts of funding coming out of Sacramento with the TERSEP and other programs. Um, also had the opportunity to sit down and uh, meet with Congressman Panetta, and we uh, talked about the upcoming grant application that we'll submit. Uh, we'll actually submit that grant next week. It's for uh, 20 hydrogen buses, a hydrogen fueling facility, and some uh, money for uh, maintenance to be able to maintain <coughs> the hydrogen fleet. Uh, that is a, a $40 million grant, and so it uh, will provide you your first uh, entry into hydrogen zero emission buses. It was the, uh, you know, it was a trajectory that uh, Alex had uh, been working on with staff, and so I was, I was pleased to, to uh, work with Wandamu to get that grant uh, ready to go for next week. Um, I'll have more to, to say on that in just a few minutes, but I um, also had the opportunity to sit down for an afternoon and talk to Guy Preston, and uh, so very impressed there with him and with RTC and look forward to uh, to working with him. And, uh, you know, I, I've just got a lot of other meet and greets coming up, so if there's some folks in particular that uh, you think I ought to meet with, I'd, I'd love to hear that. Uh, uh, I've met, for example, with the Capitola city manager and the economic direct development director to talk about uh, what's going on in Capitola, and that was a very enjoyable uh, meeting. So uh, with that, um, there's just a couple of items I think are potentially on your mind, maybe top of mind, because you've been talking about them uh, fairly frequently in your previous board meetings. We've got the governor's uh, proposal. Uh, as you'll recall, he has uh, proposed to provide vehicle owners uh, $400 for each vehicle they own up to two vehicles. And in exchange for that, uh, or coinciding with that, uh, his offer was to fund uh, public transit to create a fare free environment for riders for a three month period. And so uh, just a, a quick report, that's a, uh, it's evolving into a, a grant program where transit and rail agencies uh, would apply for that money. Uh, it looks like the bill's moving forward, uh, anticipating that it could be approved by the legislature as early, as early as June. And then Metro in return to take advantage uh, would, uh, as well as all transit agencies, would need to begin providing that fare free service no later than August of 2022. And then we would be reimbursed uh, as soon as November of 2022 for that uh, three month period. 
So the, the proposal really is to um, allocate to transit agencies um, in an amount that is uh, proportional to Metro's percentage of overall transit fare revenues in the fiscal year 20. So it just kind of gives you an idea. I, I'm working with Wandamu. Uh, we think that uh, we'll be made whole uh, as we move forward and uh, provide that three month uh, fare free experience. Um, should that uh, proposal move forward and be approved by the legislature. And then finally, uh, you know, AB 1919, I think you've had some discussions in the past. That is the uh, proposed legislation to go fare free on transit uh, for persons 25 years of age and under. And I think it's fair to say that it's a, it's a nice concept, but it uh, was really lacking in, in the bill in regard to implementation and funding and how that the mechanics would work. Uh, that bill recently had some major amendments to it. And uh, we're still looking at the amendments, but I think the, 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 the gist of it is that it is turned into a grant program. So it's not a, a program that will obligate transit agencies to participate. And there's uh, identified in the amended bill, 115 million towards that grant program, which is really a small amount of money when you consider statewide. And, uh, and it's not even identified where that funding would come from. So uh, we'll keep you posted on that bill. Uh, I think it's got a long ways to go with lots of amendments. Uh, the current position from the California Transit Association was, was a no and they've been working uh, with the author and others to, to try and create amendments that would work for transit. So uh, I'm sure you might have questions on that. Uh, and I, we do have one to move here, um, but I did have just a couple of other things to kind of conclude my report. Uh, I think you're familiar and have uh, been accustomed to receiving a report from the agency on COVID. And um, with COVID, if you uh, have three positives in a 14 day rolling period, you enter what's called a, a minor outbreak for Cal OSHA. And at the beginning of May, we had three positives within a 14 day period and entered into a minor outbreak over in the operations building. So that required that the operators return to, uh, or operations personnel return to wearing masks while in that building. Um, you know, uh, things have gone well since, and we actually exit out of that minor outbreak period today. So I just want to give the board a heads up. You know, I think things are, are moving along uh, without too much disruption uh, from the, a COVID perspective and our employees having COVID. Um, and uh, I, I know that our, you know, Curtis has been all, all over this as far as uh, enforcement and just keeping us at a minimum with that minor outbreak. Uh, I just, you know, there were just a few other things I thought uh, perhaps would be important to talk about. Um, as I've listened to board members and I've listened really closely to operators and maintenance folks and, and this executive and senior leadership team and, and really kind of begun to dug in, um, you know, it, it just is, it, it goes without saying that the number one priority on my plate for sure is to get operators on board. <clears throat> and I think we'll talk more about that later on the agenda, but just as a preview to that, uh, Don took a quick snapshot of the last 12 months, and you've had three operators leaving the agency on average for every one operator that has been hired and retained. So it's a, it's a kind of a sobering thought. Uh, I think the bottom line is your operators are providing a lot of service on the street right now for the number of operators that we have. And, you know, I, I'm worried about uh, operator fatigue and, uh, you know, just burnout. And uh, obviously there's a lot of overtime there. And when you have a collision, so to speak, of uh, a payday on a, on a weekend or going into a weekend and a holiday on that weekend and good weather, you know, it's, it's tough for operators to come in after working a, a full 40 during the week and, and provide that overtime on the, on the weekend. And I think we saw that on Mother's Day weekend where we dropped 28 trips over the weekend just with operator shortage. So I think the board, you know, I'll, I'll continue to talk about uh, the current service level that we are providing versus the number of operators that uh, we have on the street. But I, I just think my number one priority is to get more folks on board and get them trained and, 
and out on the road so that we can provide that higher level of service. Um, I think two other things, uh, well, just one other thing on my mind that I'll share and then I'll, I'll step down for the day, but uh, um, I, I really feel like uh, coming up in the near future, and I've heard this from a few board members, but really have it's uh, kind of uh, solidified in my mind, I think, and I hope we could anticipate perhaps having a strategic workshop for the board you know, maybe an offsite session. Uh, I think there's a lot to talk about. Uh, you've got battery electric buses in your fleet. You've got a potential hydrogen project uh, around the corner. I think it'd be nice to decompress those two topics and to talk more about the technologies of each of those uh, technologies and uh, the pros and the cons and where your staff recommendation lies. Uh, I think it's really important to talk about some of these technology projects like your AVL and your APC uh, project. And uh, we've got a potential South County O&M facility um, that staff is uh, working on the concept there. Uh, I think it'd be great to have a lengthy discussion on that, uh, as well as your planned paracure cruise facility. Um, you know, and, and there's other projects. And I, I guess in the overall scheme of things, um, yeah, I think it'll be important to talk about those projects as they relate to your budget. And you've heard Chuck say that at your next meeting, he's gonna show you a glimpse of what your reserves look like. And all of those projects basically have either local matches or, or greater uh, from local funding sources to complete them. So, hey, with that said, I just uh, wanna leave the note that uh, really excited to be here and uh, with with the staff you have, there's going to be great things that continue to happen around the agency. Thank you, Michael. Uh, questions or comments from the board? Michael Rockton. So, um, first of all, I'll just note that there's also, in addition to the uh, assembly bill that um, Michael Tree mentioned, there's also a Senate bill that has to do with youth, um, free youth uh, passes, and that's under consideration. And they're, they're, we need to track those in some level. What's good about these is unlike the ones last year, this would be the state paid for this, not mandating that we pay for it, which is an impossibility for us. Um, and so we need to keep, one of the issues has to do with how you get paid back. In other words, if you provide free service for a pass, when does the state give you the money um, if, if it's gonna happen at all and whether we might wanna apply for that. Because I think in general, getting young people used to riding the bus is a great idea. And so I, I'm in support of the concept. The question is how, it, as, you, as Michael had said, how does it actually you know, work <laughs> in a detailed way so that we don't end up being shorted by the process? Related to that, the issue of the three month free service the state's looking at, I wonder if we have, this is a question, I wonder if we have in place um, uh, procedures or how we're gonna handle the problem that often happens with free service, which is people who are not really looking for transit service, but looking for a place to spend the day inside of a bus. And that's been a problem in the past when we had free service days Drivers have reported that problem. Um, we are obviously don't want that to be the only driver and the only consideration, but it is a concern when somebody kind of camps out on the bus for the day and they're not trying to go anywhere. They're going around in a circle. They eventually get off where they got on after riding around all day and picking up a seat and often bringing a lot of stuff with them in the process. So I'm not asking if you have an answer to that now, but whether we have a process to begin thinking about that before we would implement that kind of service. I think it's a good point, Mike. I, uh, for board member Rock, and I, uh, uh, we operated Fair Free in Missoula, and that also has a shelterless or a homeless issue uh, in the community. And then, obviously, during COVID, uh, many transit agencies throughout uh, operated Fair Free. So, I think the long story short is that it, it, it does uh, require more attention from your supervisory staff and from others at the agency that you normally wouldn't have, uh, and some policies. So, um, you know, I'll take a look. Staff has already begun discussion on this three month period of fare free and, and how to work with that with, uh, with policy. So I'll, I'll report back to the board on that. Thank you. And the other question I had was, um, is there anything that you can share with us about what current plans might be to try and deal with the driver shortage? I know you've been thinking about this and beginning to talk to people about what might be possible, including bringing up the bottom pay. I don't know that we have a plan ready to go or something, but um, I, I, the concern is that, you know, we're just, it's happening and are, are we do, what are we doing to respond to it? How, how seriously are we taking this issue in terms of actually coming up with some way of changing the situation? Because just asking again is not gonna do the trick. Obviously we've been, 
our, our uh, HR staff's been doing a great job of doing outreach, but it's just not getting us the drivers we need. Yeah. <clears throat> you know, I think a short answer for that would be that uh, we've kind of got a multi-prong approach going. We, we've been talking about um, the wage, that introductory wage. Uh, we've looked at the marketing material to make sure that uh, we're making some adjustments to the marketing materials. Um, we've been talking internally about a referral bonus that's fairly substantial to really get the drivers motivated and others to go out and talk to people who are like-minded, right? Who, uh, who would potentially be a great uh, referral to the agency. Um, we've been spending a lot of time uh, talking with uh, SMART about the importance of schedules and creating a livable schedule, especially for these entry-level drivers who often are coming in off of a commute. And then the expectation is to work a pretty difficult split shift. Um, so we've been talking about uh, how we can create uh, schedules that are, uh, you know, more straight aids or, or something similar. Uh, and then we've uh, been talking about uh, with, uh, with operators, I've been having some discussions about just how to make uh, the area in the operations center function better for them so that as operators come in, uh, you know, uh, there's some things to do if there happens to be a split shift that needs to be worked, uh, maybe a fitness center and some other minor upgrades that really wouldn't be difficult to implement. So just uh, moving towards uh, becoming even more of a kind of a choice employer in Santa Cruz County. Um, we haven't been talking about any major expenses. I mean, these are all things that can be done very quickly and I think would have a pretty positive impact on folks uh, taking a look at becoming an operator. Thank you. Yeah. Director Lynn. Yes, you know, with uh, we've had trouble with Scottsdale Police Department and city employees recruiting as well. And I, I think every all the industry has, but the um, referral bonuses did seem to help when we had officers out there recruiting friends. We've been able to pick up officers from um, other agencies or in the academy from those bonuses. So I'm, I'm glad to hear you looking at that. It, it can help. And um, just another thing, I was up in Sacramento last week with a city leaders summit and we met with, uh, in fact, had a 45 minute meeting with John Laird and met with other senators and assemblymen and talked. And I did bring, use that time to bring up some of the concerns for the assembly bill and Senate bills that would affect Metro and talked a little bit about um, the programs we have in place, working partnerships with UCSC and Cabrillo and you know, just tried to, to ask them to look further, look closer. And um, there was actually, I, several of them took notes, didn't really know um, a lot about either of the bills, but they did take notes, gave me cards to follow up on. So hopefully in addition to advocating for funding locally, um, I was able to get some information uh, you know, about Metro concerns as well. Very good, thank you, Director Lynn. Anyone else? Not seeing any hands. Uh, I think that may be- Maybe the public. Uh, right, thank you, Mike. And uh, to the public, our small audience, uh, anyone have a question or comment here? Seeing no hands. So I think, oh, Dan, Director Henderson. Hi everyone, this, this question is a little bit out of left field, but it has come up uh, recently and I've talked to John Ergo a little bit about it, uh, but I wanted to put it out there on folks radar, boards radar to see if it's possible. And I don't know if it is, but if we have an archive of headways, the digital version of headways or some way to put online um, uh, past schedules, past service levels uh, of different routes, uh, for folks reference, um, obviously at UCSC, we could we use it for maybe uh, other purposes than the general public would use. Um, but it's difficult for me to, to find, you know, what was in like 2018 and those types of things. Um, and I do refer to the headways, the, the digital version on head, headways on the, on the web pretty often, but there's no archive. So I don't know if something like that exists or if it's even possible, but I wanted to throw it out there to see 
uh, if somebody can chew on it and think about how an archive can be made available with, uh, with past service levels. Yeah, I think All we can right. take a look at that. Thank you. Thank you. I know, out of left field, but I want to throw it out. Dan, I hate to tell you, but I think I had a box of all these old headways for many years up above your office at one time. I'm I think we sure threw it away. Yeah. <laughs> they weren't digital. Right. Thank you, though. Right. I appreciate the consideration. Anyone else? And I'm checking the public one more time. I'm seeing no hands. So I believe I will announce our next meeting on Friday, June 24th at 9 a.m. And we're about to go into closed session. Uh, just, I will ask, yes, please, yeah, Julie, go, go ahead. ahead. Uh, we do have one labor negotiation section and all of the board members and essential staff should have received an invitation. Just let Donna know if you did not receive one. And I believe that came out just this morning. Correct. Thank you, Julie. All right. And with that, I believe we will go to closed session. Very good. And with that, I'll close the meeting at, uh, uh oh, I'm, I'm in East Coast time. Uh, what is that? Uh, 1104, I think. Yeah, it is. <laughs> All right. All right. Have a great All right. Day. Everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Take care, everyone.